Now I'm going to give you a demo of 5G morphed reality. What does that really mean? So two things are going to happen. I'm going to wear this. And the first level that I'm going to show you is going to be what this device and its own computing power can do, which means it will take me into a virtual reality world, a forest. Very nice. Everything is very, very decent. But it's not spectacular. Why? Because you're restricted by the amount of computing power this headset can have. Now imagine if this headset was only a wire media. 5G streaming with very low latency, extremely fast speeds coming from a very high-end computer. Now what they've done is they've hidden a gaming computer at the back of this console. Now what will happen is that one connected with 5G connectivity streaming this. That means the processing is going on on that computer. I'll press a button. You'll see my blue hand. You're seeing now what exactly happens when the streaming is coming from a computing device where it's taken all that processing power onto the computer and whatever other results are being streamed onto this. This is quite a demo. Imagine this, you're in a Microsoft Teams meeting, three of you. One of you is in an office, one of you has gone running and the third one is at an airport. Imagine all three of you come together in that environment, two people that are outdoor actually getting avatars. You can see it right now. Even gestures, if I put my hand up and say thumbs up or I say yes or even a hi, everything is translated. That's because we're doing something here, dynamic device compute offload, which means this that is enabling all of that is also taken off. Ericsson's 5G network can take that entire computing, put it in a cloud. I am seeing an avatar right now. If I look at that person and another person walks by, now I can relate to people because they're all around me rather than only looking at people on screen, right? So this is a big game changer. We have a very interesting insight on how all of this offloading, computing, AI, A APIs will absolutely and totally be something that you've never experienced before. When they said 5G will really live up to expectations and surpass them, this is a great example. So one of the biggest things that's happening, you know that 5G AI is like almost the perfect soulmates, right? But there is a third part of it that is coming that is completely going to revolutionize everything we do. Apps, services that are specially made for us as consumers or for enterprise, but using network APIs. Now, what is a network API? What is AI inside a network? These are fairly complex terms, but I got the perfect person to take us through what all this means and how it's going to change your life. So he's going to be joining me very, very soon. So congratulations, I've been seeing some very interesting demos around AI and everything else. But you know, I want to start off with the part that I'm most intrigued by. Mm -hmm. What is AI in a network? So when we talk about AI in the telecom network, I think the first question to maybe ask is why AI in the telecom network? Let's start with the why, right? Part of the challenge that we are seeing with the evolution of telecom networks is that from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G, and in the future into 6G, telecom networks are becoming increasingly more capable and therefore also increasingly more complex, right? So there's a lot of complexity that goes into the operations and management of a telecom network today. And that is getting to a point where it is becoming very difficult to manage this network using just human capabilities. Okay. As an example, some of the configuration manuals that we have for configuring certain parts of the network run into volumes more than 1,000 pages. And it's humanly impossible for someone to go through all of that and to be able to configure it in a manner that's most optimal. And therefore, what you need is a system that can continually monitor how the network is doing. And based on the current state of the network, take actions. Getting it right once is one thing. But telecom networks are not static. They are dynamic. They are impacted by weather. They are impacted by traffic. They are impacted by events to restore the network back so to the give me an operating. example. What could be happening <clears throat> for AI to play a role and therefore, I, I can understand maybe power consumption, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that must be one of the biggest ones, right? right. And, and also <clears throat> one of the most uh, expensive things for network service providers. So give me an example within the, the power savings. How would AI be able to do something with that? One? Absolutely. So one of the projects that we did actually for several telecom operators in the Moai region uh, um, was they were interested in understanding how AI can help them reduce the power consumption of the network, right? And until now, what we had was uh, best practices based on human knowledge, right? So 
we understand certain thresholds can be programmed into the network where if you see the network operating above or below a threshold, certain rules will apply, right? And the problem with this, as with a lot of other things when it comes to telecom, is that static thresholds only get you so far, right? As I said, the network is not static, right. it's continually changing. So now comes an AI and says, okay, let's not worry about static thresholds. I will monitor what's happening in the network, right? And when I see the network load increasing, I will switch on the behavior to a more sort of uh, uh, capacity optimized view of functioning. And when I see that the network load is dropping or other parameters are indicating that it is sort of getting into a quiet mode, then I will configure it so that the network sort of goes into a sleep mode, right? And the ability to do this, not as a pre-configured static way, but as a dynamic way, responding to what's happening to the network at that point in time, that's the role of AI. So, so let's get down to the part which, mm. again, I find needs a lot of explanation for people. It's one of the most exciting places for me. Mm. But again, a lot of people don't really understand what is network APIs yeah. and all of these other things because it seems to be this big explosion and especially the kind of investments that Ericsson is making Make. into it. Mm. So explain to me what network APIs are. Yeah. How does it affect the normal enterprise or normal consumer? If you look at telecom networks, Right. Traditionally, they have been fairly closed networks, right? Standards driven, fairly closed. And that served its purpose in a very good way because that made telecom networks very interoperable because they were all compliant to, uh, to standards. They made them extremely secure, right? But the challenge now that we see is with all the new capabilities coming in with 4G, 5G, and with, with 5G advanced and later with 6G, we need a way to make it easy for people to tap into the capabilities of the network. And that hasn't happened so far because you and I cannot really access a telecom network today. So the question then was, how do we make what we see as a huge asset network as a platform, as how we're looking at right now? Mm -hmm. How do we take, how do we shift the thinking from network as just a connectivity bit pipe okay. to network as a platform that will enable developers and others to write applications using the capabilities of the network? So if today, if you had a very capable developer and you ask him or her to write a, a piece of code that took advantage of something in your network, the first question they would ask is, well, how do I access your network? How do I access this capability? All this looks wonderful that you talk about 5G, low latency, uh, ultra high bandwidth, etc. but how do I as a developer gain access to this, right? And that's where network API comes in. So the first step to being able to expose something as an API is to make the networks programmable. But what we're talking about with network APIs is to make the network programmable on the fly. You, me, enterprises, businesses, anybody, if they gain, if they have access to the API, they can write applications that take advantage of those APIs and make those capabilities available uh, to, to the end user. And I think once the capabilities of the network are actually exposed and made available, then our belief, our premise here is that the innovation of the developers will take over and then we will see new kinds of applications coming in that we haven't even thought about. And for an API to be truly usable, to be truly powerful, it has to be global. The same API should work here as it works in the US or Japan, right? And that's why Ericsson has formed this new company, right? Where it's brought in all of these leading telecom operators so that we can actually have an aggregation layer, right? That takes in all of these APIs and makes- and Therefore, them. someone yeah. that is writing a particular application or a particular service and is using an API that becomes a global standard. It doesn't, exactly. have, to keep, API. Exactly. It doesn't have to keep rejigging it. Saying that what different geography? Here in, in, in Italy, it's very different from the US, from Canada, from other places, right? Okay, fantastic. You know, I'm very, very excited. Everything that you've spoken about, especially APIs, I think is may well be the biggest game changer I've heard of. To truly be able to write to the true capability of a network and to be able to harness that power out, I think is just absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for speaking Thank with you. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.